Hello and welcome to We Never Met, the podcast where I have interesting strangers. I have three today on the podcast. If you guys want to introduce yourself, you can start down there. I'm Annie Avilas, and I am the lead brewer of Steeplejack Brewing. I'm Anna Buxton, and I'm the head brewer at Steeplejack Brewing. And I'm Brody Dam, one of the co-owners of Steeplejack Brewing. Thank you guys for having me here in this beautiful place. We just took a tour. It, you used all your good material, you said? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't talk so much on the tour. Yes, exactly. Like, yeah. just be quiet stories. for the next hour. Yeah. I have nothing else to say. Over. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for having me here. And it's uh, it's so beautiful. I encourage everyone to to come down and check it out. When is it officially opening? July 31st, our grand opening will be. July 31st. Excellent. Yeah. So, yeah, it's crazy just looking at the the stained glass and stuff. So I guess to start off, before we even get into each of you individually, how did you guys all meet? Like, how did you guys all come together? Because you're from different parts of the country and have done different things. So how did you even meet in the first place? Well, I think you guys knew each other before you knew me, right? Just kind of. Periphery style. Yeah. Like mm. Annie and I were in a lot of the same sort of like, if there was a, a brewer gathering of 20 people or more, we were both there, but... Sure never quite seemed to be in the same conversation. So it was mm. like, someone was like, oh, Annie Vilas, do you know her? I'd be like, oh, of her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've seen her. Also, if there was yeah. a lineup of women brewing in Portland who I didn't know their names, I don't know if I could have picked. Oh, sure. I would have been able to be like one of those two for sure, you know? Yeah. But I'd be like, I don't know, you know? So it was like, we never quite got to have conversations before we okay. met. Sure. You know, officially. Yeah. Yeah. And but. so when Dustin and I, we wanted to start a brewery and we started, uh, you know, we had to start with construction, all, all that sort of stuff. When we started our brewer search, I'm good friends with a brewer named Annie Johnson. And she's a longtime home brewer, lives up in Seattle. And we, we and I, we home brewed, I don't know, 20 plus years ago in Sacramento, mm-hmm. California. And anyway, I talked to her and she's like, oh, like I have some brewers I should put you in contact with. Yeah. And that was right during my search. And so that's how initially I met uh Anna. And then a couple of weeks later, in the same conversations with Annie, she's like, oh, you got to meet Annie as well. And so oh, sure. through those conversations, it was like, wow, we'll have the opportunity to build like a phenomenal team. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I'm really, really proud of how it worked out. Because like, how does that work? Do you, is there like tryouts? Like, is it like, do you have to like go to a place and be like, <laughs> honestly, sort of like I a mean, sports thing? a little bit. Like it's so how it kind of came about on my side it was a lot of like phone conversations with Annie, her describing the project, her getting a feel of what type of worker I am and stuff. Yeah. And then eventually when I started conversations with Brody, it was a lot about like, you know, more hypothetical dreams, aspiration type stuff. But when we really sat down and had conversations, it was more about like, okay, well, if, if I were in charge of this place, mm-hmm. I would do A, B, and C. This is what my next 18 months would look like. This is how I would manage the tanks. This is how I would manage inventory this is the types of beers I would make. And Mm -hmm. in my mind, then I was like, well, this is going to put me out. Like, I'm not going to get this job because I'm, this is what I would make. And that's not necessarily what's the sexiest beer in Portland right now. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's not the really insane hazies and pastry stouts and seltzers and things. And so I was like, well, be honest, you know, really. But it just happened that really it's the exact type of beer Brody was also dreaming about too. So that kind of, was kismet in a way, yeah. you know? So it just is one of those things where it's like the perfect conversations happened right at the right time where it worked out. Yeah. Cause like what, so what beer is that? Like, what were you guys like going for when you started this idea and this dream of creating a brewery? Well, on my side, I, actually more the beer, obviously that we're focused on is going to be phenomenal. It's going to be outstanding, but I was interested in the people, you know, mm. first and foremost. Yeah. And I saw in Anna, this, you know, maybe awkward saying right in front of you, whatever, you know, because I'm going to shower you with, shower you with, oh, with compliments. No. Right? Oh, but, but no, what I would say is that uh, Anna, uh, so I interviewed, I inter- actually interviewed, and I think you guys know this too, but uh, hopefully, yeah. I mean, but I interviewed more than a dozen brewers all over the country. Some, yeah huge breweries, well-known breweries, smaller, lesser-known breweries. Sure. And whenever I met with Anna, she was the yardstick for every mm. other brewer that I met with. And she was not only the most prepared, the, wow. but so this is, you know, sorry, I know this is getting all mushy <laughs> no, over very here. very nice, yeah. Uh, but, um, but she struck me right away to say, gosh, this is, regardless of the beer, I know the beer is going to be great. Sure. I want Anna on my team because mm. I know that we're going to produce a phenomenal product and she's going to fit in so well with the rest of the organization that I'm building. So, cause when you're starting a company, you want, you know, I mean, like I've worked for large companies in the past and it's a little bit different working for those large companies because 
when you hire someone, at some point, they're just going to find their niche because there's so many people to find their niche with. Mm. When you're starting a company in the ground up, it's like, wow, like if Anna doesn't get along with my GM, yeah. like that's a big problem. It's not like, well, right. she can buddy up with somebody else. It's like, yeah. this is the, the ground floor. We all need to be aligned with what we're trying to build. So anyway, that I don't know if that... No, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. And that's something that as... I know both Annie and I, as we were making our own decisions, like we could both come from these like really great breweries that mm. have very specific workplace cultures that we fit in with. Yeah. And so it's like kind of scary to leave sometimes. But when you realize it's like when you're starting a new business, you can create the work environment you desire. So yeah. like if we like specific things in our workplaces, you can create that around you, you know, setting up who you hire, you know, all yeah. that stuff too. But also like conversations you have when you hire people, when it's a smaller business, you can manipulate it in a way that creates this work environment that we all wish for, especially in Portland beer when yeah. it can be so like the same and exhausting. Sometimes yeah. we can create this environment that we have always dreamed about. Yeah. And you can also tell, I think when you go to a brewery, you know, just by, even if you don't interact with the people like the head brewer or something, mm -hmm. the whole staff, you can just tell the vibe of like yeah, how yeah. everyone interacts and yeah like if, if it seems like everyone's like stressed out and pissed off and <laughs> or just exhausted mad at you yeah, for some mad, reason. yeah mad at you for being in their business yeah, yeah. like but it's also very portland to be mad yeah. <laughs> like, that's true yeah. <laughs> like what are you yeah. doing here well yeah. this is a coffee shop sir like yeah. i would like <laughs> it is your privilege okay. yeah, yeah. you're yeah. welcome do you know welcome who i portland. am you're welcome. do you know where you are yeah, yeah. well i think it's just like yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I joke, but Portland beer, when I get asked the question a lot, is like, oh, what is it like being a woman mm -hmm. in the industry? Yeah. I know we're going to talk about that at some point, but yeah. we are very spoiled in Portland. Mm -hmm. We have a very tight kinship and camaraderie, and it is unlike any other industry, let alone brewing industry, I think, that yeah. exists out here. And it's it's hard to pinpoint where that comes from and why that exists, but yeah, I think it's a lot of the fact that there's so many breweries in Portland and that we do move around mm -hmm. a lot and we do respect the beer that we do at each brewery. And we don't necessarily see our chapter at a brewery as like the past we see as like a building to yeah. that individual's as a brewing career and yeah. what that's going to do for us in the future. Yeah, because that, that is interesting because I, I come from, as we talked about before, Milwaukee, which has a ton of breweries. And I think out of all of them, there was one female brewer in all of the breweries That's that crazy. existed. Yeah, like when you get into yeah. that yeah. part of the Midwest, like I know. So I'm imagining. I think Annie's probably interacted with with Meg. Uh, uh, uh -huh. She's a, a yeah. brewer at North Coast, and she's in Pittsburgh. She's like mm. not only the first female brewer hired, but also like the first head brewer and stuff. And so it's like yeah. interacting with her because she's was a rock bottom brewer. So I just through working and stuff have been able to ask advice and things like that and her experience versus like my experience in portland and then also my experience in california like super super different and so yeah. it's it's it is interesting as we talk about like gender identities within like industry in general like not just yeah. brewing it's, yeah i think in portland certainly there's like really frustrating things that are very portland specific but yeah. like mostly it's because the Portland beer scene is so incestuous, it's like if someone somewhere, it's all word of mouth hiring. So it's mm. like if someone somewhere decided that you're like a deadbeat employee, you have to work yeah, that then much you harder. can't work anywhere. No, and you can't sure. work anywhere. Yeah. It could just be someone's grudge. Like not yeah. even, or it could be like you were an exceptional worker and they were jealous or yeah. intimidated by you and yeah. then they snuff you out. So it's like, yeah. mm. I think Portland, while it does like really help because there are so many women in power mm. brewing and there's so many we're willing to accept different gender identities in general. So yeah. it's like, I mean, I lived in Montana and tried for two and a half years to find a brewing job with no luck. I got a job as yeah. a dishwasher in a brewery, yeah. but never as a brewer. And so like, and I moved to Portland, I had a job in the first week. So it's right. like, it's much easier to kind of get in, but I think that it has its own gambit of issues for sure. Yeah. Cause it has to, I, I feel like it has to be super frustrating, especially when you want to do something so bad and you know that you're, you're and then you know it. you're going to be good at it. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. And especially if you know you're going to be good at it. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's uh, convincing others to yeah. see your vision, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Which is true of anything. And yeah. It's insane yeah. In With 2021, anything. we're even talking about. I mean, it just, I it just right. shocks the conscience that, you know, like any other industry, I mean, how, like, in what universe would this be acceptable, you know? Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's hard to, hard to fathom. Yeah. 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 
I think every industry has its own kind of unique sets of issues. Yeah. And so like within Portland's beer scene, the issues are more like, even though there are a lot of women in brewing, there's still some like tokenism. And so mm. it's kind of overcoming some of that. Too. Yeah. So like, yeah. honestly, like a, a thing that has been really wonderful about the experience of building this team at Steeplejack is mm. not only is it, you know, me and Annie and we have both have very unique, specific experiences in the Portland beer scene, but also the people that we're working with also mm. not only have worked with, you know, women in power, but also are not intimidated to have their coworkers be yeah. empowered, you know, just yeah. in general. And so I think that having it be, we all want to do good. We all, you know, like high tides float all the ships, right? So mm -hmm. we all want to make each other be the best workers they can be. So yeah. that's kind of, I think, unique in general in any workplace. Yeah. I mean, I think you guys are just unique in most workplaces. <laughs> <laughs> because, Pierce uh, Root. yeah, Root just one, generally two, speaking. Cause oh, I you, missed out. We got to do it again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was, it's so insane because um, i mean like your backgrounds are just like i've talked to a lot of brewers and stuff like that and i've never had such an eclectic group of people you know <laughs> so i i guess that brings me to just starting out like your specific vision for like why you came to portland why you wanted to start a brewery you're working at a, a massive corporation and then you you retired right and you were like i'm done and starting this brewery so coming from an experience of like having a lot of home brewing experience, but then I guess, cause like home brewing is different than being like, I'm going to start a business, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. you have to take a massive step to do that. So what was that reason for you? Let's see. So it was like 20 plus years in the making. So Dustin yeah. and I, Dustin's my business partner and just a good friend. And we took a backpacking trip through Germany and Austria between our freshman year and sophomore year in college. And in that trip, I uh, had my first beer at the Hofbrauhaus House in Munich. And I had that was, a your, that was your first beer ever. My first beer ever. And I had, <laughs> a, I had a, liter, a liter of Dunkel. And uh, I thought, well, you know, first I was like, whoa, I really like the taste of this. This is yeah. really good. And then also immediately I was like, wow, this, you know, is fun. And, you know, I'm yeah. really enjoying this. And, and from that point, I just fell in love with beer. So I came back from that summer. And I immediately rushed out to, I think I bought it like Home Depot or a hardware store, the one of those Mr. Beer kits, like the plastic mm. barrel. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and I started like mixing it or whatever. And it came and uh, it wasn't so good. <laughs> and so from there, I, I wasn't discouraged. I just kept brewing and brewing and, yeah. and met more people. And I just loved it. I, I found something kind of magical about fermentation and the science. But more important than any of that was I love the community it brought. And home brewers are kind of an eclectic batch of folks anyway, just mm. in terms of different perspectives, different life experiences. You know, you could have engineers, you could have sure. carpenters, you know, and all in the same group and you're united around brewing great beer. Yeah. And so from that point, so Dustin and I have always been good friends throughout our life. And, you know, life is kind of funny. Like, you know, it's always like, hey, are we going to open that brewery next year? Sure, yeah. sure. Well, I kept climbing the corporate ladder and, and Dustin's working his family company and Finally, like well, I was living in Minneapolis and, and had a job that was traveling a lot and uh, kind of away from my family. And we mm -hmm. said, gosh, you know, are we going to do this? Are we ever going to do this? It yeah. was the right time to move to the West Coast to be closer to family. And so we said, yeah, we're going to do it. And so what do we do? We buy a church. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? straight away. Yeah yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. Built in 1909. And we just thought, gosh, this would be like, you know, one to save the building, you know, but then sure. also we thought, you know, again, going back to my home brewing days where it's really about the community. It's about the mm -hmm. activity of gathering. It's about, it's, it's more than the beer is what I'm trying to say. Right. And so could we create that here? And the answer for us was yes. So, yeah. I mean, having a beer in Germany, I feel like as your first one is just like, how do you top <laughs> that ever? At the Hopper House. Yeah. Yeah. Too, I know. Yeah. yeah. So. My first beer was a Miller Lite. So oh, I can only go like up right. Exactly. Oh, that's a champagne. Oh, no, no, no. I think it was like a Heineken. Heineken? Okay. And I was like super small. So my parents, my dad's from Ecuador. My mom's from Poland. So I'm first generation American. So their values and medicinal practices are very archaic. Mm. And So you're that, a baby, you're saying. Yeah. 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 So yeah. as a crying child, something that they just like gave me pinky dips of whiskey and little yeah. tiny baby spoons of Heineken to make me yeah. go to sleep. <laughs> no, that, that's such a that yeah. generation thing to do. Yeah. I feel like my parents uh, yeah. would have done that for sure. Uh, mine was Guinness, but yeah, same. Yeah. It's just you when you have, you know, Irish mm -hmm. folks versus yeah. 
Polish Dominican folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I, yeah. I, I had Guinness. I, so I uh, lived in Ireland for six months. And the, oh, like, the first beer I had there was a Guinness. I think I was 20. And I never had a Guinness before. And I couldn't do it. Whereabouts it. in <laughs> Ireland were you? It's too thick. It was, uh, I was in Limerick. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you were like in good. Uh, the beer was too real. Guinness country. <laughs> it was too real. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, that, Far Cry yeah, from Miller Lite. Yeah, 4.2%. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah it's like drinking a milkshake. Draft, uh, and, yeah. <laughs> it was tough. It was like, uh, I don't know how early you guys started drinking or how normalized that was, but it's very normal in Wisconsin to drink from a young age, obviously. Yeah. And, you have to like um, just go into the bar with your parents, right? Yeah, you as can long drink as you're with your parents. parents. Yeah. It's, you yeah. have to be within like an arm's reach, right? For yeah, sure. That's, it's like if you're, that's, that's the sort yeah, of rule, you know. As long as, as, long as they exist there, I think, is, is more <laughs> the rule. As long as you can grab your kid. Yeah, that's that's my mom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so my folks like dabbled in home brewing, but it was yeah. more like, my parents were, I mean, my mom's a multimedia artist and then my dad was an environmental engineer. So they were like kind of hippie folks built their mm. own, the, their first house was a home they built and stuff. So my dad would keep homebrew in our closet and would forget about it for forever. They would make it together and then they would just like forget about it. So constantly you'd open our coat closet. This is when we lived in the Tri-Cities and it would just be like beer exploded everywhere. And you'd be like, well, shit, let's try again and gather wow. it up, make more beer. <laughs> yeah. And then my extended family are in in wine so it's just mm. kind of been a part of my like home life yeah mostly though more than home brewing was like baking and stuff like mm. making bread making your own food pickling canning yeah. Did that like catch your eye when you were young, like the brewing thing? Because you took a, a very different turn as yeah, you got older. Yeah, I mean, like more so just like a connection with food. Like my mom is not at all a cook. My dad did a lot of the cooking in you know my home life growing up and stuff. But food, growing your own food, where does your food come from? Is has always been like mm. more out of like cost necessity a part of my childhood, sure. but eventually became like a really important part of like my own identity. Is like. Mm cooking and food and yeah. beer is just kind of a natural extension of, yeah. of that for sure and when you add like art to science that's like exactly my parents you know created that and kind of fostered that environment and so yeah no for sure yeah i did definitely take like a weird turn so i worked in uh, i originally went to school in chinese language and uh, that's what i graduated and actually so like I so guess, can you speak mandarin so can you still <laughs> or was it about that or no? Yeah. So like when I was going to school, I spoke two dialects of Chinese. So wow. where I went to school, so I, what I should say is I originally went to school in primate behaviors and linguistic anthropology mm. and was more interested in like language study. And then I was there on scholarship. And when I realized I don't see myself getting a master's doctorate, continuing mm. this for the rest of my life, I need to kind of pivot, get a degree and move on. I have a background in music. I've always been really good with languages and words. And so I was like, well, I'll uh, apply directly to a Chinese university because they go to school so often you can finish sure. a degree pretty quickly. Yeah. So I applied to uh, Xinan Minzu Dashui, which is in Sichuan province, Chengdu, China. So I got in, I found a university in the States, which was the University of Idaho to accredit those mm. credits that I would earn in China and moved to Chengdu. Wow. to finish school. Uh, and I knew a little bit of Chinese, like conversational Chinese, okay, but sure. uh, like Mandarin. But in Sichuan, especially in Chengdu, they don't really speak Mandarin. They speak Shishunha. So it's like a completely different dialect of Chinese. Mm. And so a lot of like So what did you do? <laughs> so, so like all my classes were in... So some of my classes were a mix between English and Mandarin. A lot of them were just in Mandarin. And then I would... So I did a couple things. So when I was a kid, I was I played the harp. So actually, like mm. I had from I was homeschooled a lot, and so I played the harp and had kind of a professional music career. So I was like, well, I'll learn a Chinese instrument. That's a good way to learn Chinese, right? Yeah. And so I, I like applied to the university that was in that city that was the, the music school. So I had to audition with like a professor and he was like okay I, I will teach you how to play the arhu so i would go weekly and learn to play the arhu and from him i would learn subs because he didn't speak any mandarin so i would like mm. try to learn speak mandarin to him and then he would try to speak to me and sure. then we would kind of make it through and it'd be fine but then also like the neighborhood i lived in i lived in an apartment in a uyghur neighborhood that was right next to a white neighborhood so those both those minorities in china don't speak Mandarin. Mm. They speak Sichuanhua or their own dialects and stuff. So that was a really 
hard, but you know, like when you're in it and you have to, you're like, I want four eggs, you know, yeah. like you figure out what to say and stuff. So that's really like kind of how that came about. But yeah. Yeah. How long were you there? How long were you in China? So I was there for almost two years. So wow. yeah. So it was like, I was there for what would be five quarters mm. in the States. Yeah. With some buffer time and stuff. So it was enough to finish full degrees, <laughs> two <Yeah>. full degrees, <laughs> like separately. So wow. yeah. So I ended up getting a degree in Chinese language and then a degree in religious studies from Shinami to Dashwe. And then they transferred to University of Idaho and then they transferred to Central Washington University, which is where I went to school in primate behaviors. So wow. Yeah. <laughs> How'd you decide what to pack? I, yeah. oh, and actually it's kind of like a, a wild cases, story. Or? So I, I moved there with like a backpack and then when it was time for me to move home, More I, stuff. it was, I didn't like have, I didn't container. have too much stuff. Yeah. Like I had my instrument because, so part of like Chinese tradition is when you learn an instrument, your teacher makes an instrument for you. Oh. So, oh, wow. so like wow. my teacher made, what if you don't like, know how to make a guitar or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Like part of traditional Chinese music is like, if you play like, you know, the Arhu, this is like kind of an archaic thing, but it's like. My teacher subscribed to that philosophy where it's like, sure. so it has like a snake skin like drum. It's like a really beautiful instrument. I just like have it on the wall. It's like, I was always so shitty at it. Like I'm a, I'm a good harpist. I was a bad <laughs> Arhu player. Just bow what instruments is, are really is hard. What do you, I don't even know what that is. So Arhu is a two string fiddle. Okay. So you play it with a bow and it's like horsehair bow and it sits between the two strings. So mm -hmm. you play forward on one string or backstroke on the back string. So you okay. play between the two strings and then you... Sure. Just work it out. So yeah. I, I uh, <laughs> what are the two notes? So you just tune them differently. So uh, usually it's a, a fifth step. So cool. I was going to say, usually when there's less strings, it's almost harder to play. I feel like then there's more pressure. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I feel like so. So being a harpist, so I I do have perfect pitch. So that's I don't sing well, but I mm. can. That's part of what is really nice about and why I was able to play harp so easily so quickly is the harp deals in circle of fifths. So you're always mm -hmm. constantly thinking in these like harmonic keys and then mm -hmm. you have pedals to change. So you are manipulating the different strings between sharp, flat and neutral to change keys and play music. So yeah. I already have that kind of brain going into it. So it did help in that sense that like mm -hmm. I can think in harmonic keys already. So perfect pitch is just wild to me to so that you can just like identify a pitch and just yeah, know what it and is. And it's like especially when I was a kid, you know, I didn't know that's what it was until I cause my original teacher, she just like leaned into it and taught me how to play music. And then when I was actually like getting more competitive with harp and I got in with this harp teacher and her name's Pat Wooster. She's like a Pacific Northwest harp legend. And so mm. I like auditioned, got less in time with her and it was great. And so she was like, well, you know, you've been leaning on this crutch and you need to learn how to read sheet music now because you like you're a teenager and you with can't. no sound. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Plug your ears. <laughs> Plug your ears and just play music. Yeah. yeah. But I, other aspects like tuning and learning how to play a song and stuff has always been a lot easier for me. Yeah. Because I tried to learn how to play guitar and like the tuning stuff was just like the worst part of it. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. can, you, can you just do this for me so I can play it? Like, Get yourself a tuning box. Yeah. 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 Tuning for There's an app for it these days. I have Absolutely. One now, There's yeah. an app for it. Yeah. <laughs> really bypass all that the, yeah. the string tuning thing. <laughs> True. Like half the lesson was just like trying to tune it, you know? Yeah, I felt like yeah. that's what most of the guitar lesson was. <laughs> it's just, just tuning. I'm like, yeah. like, is there a correlation between brewers and you? Like I played the violin for like 15 years. Wow. I think – so genuinely I've thought about this a lot. I think yeah. it has to do with abstract thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I think that when you play music, especially as from a young age, it forces your brain to learn abstract thinking patterns, yeah. which is really beneficial when you're brewing because – if everything like we very rarely have the opportunity to work in breweries that are completely seamless and perfect, right. you know, so yeah. like you're constantly having to adjust and come up with alternative plans, routes, whatever to make yeah. your final project. You yeah. Know, everything that you wished it would be. Did you play instrument? I played trumpet. Did you play anything? Played the alto saxophone. Yeah, you did. Yeah. And, Look at uh, that. Yeah, I know. I was like, man, I, what, what did I even play? No, in junior high, and I was so bad. They did this like chairs. Sequel. Maybe this is no, a common they did this thing. At arts. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so first chair, yeah. I was last chair, and uh, last chair every quarter. Like Out of how I, many? And, and I would chat. There was like. 
nine or ten of us. Whoa, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, I was hard out. Yeah, I was really bad. Really, I couldn't even figure out how to put the read, you know, on the, on the thing. I'm like, I spent half, most of the time just, just trying. Yeah, and so, yeah. so, no, no, but I remember that there was this new student from a different class. He's like, oh, I've never even seen this this thing. He's like, I'm going to challenge you because you can challenge people for because he didn't yeah. want to be the last person. Right. So I'm like, well, surely I can play like hot cross buns better yeah, than this guy, right? Know. And so, yeah, so he challenges me and he wins. He's like, never touched him. I, I, oh, so anyway, that's, like that's more information than you need to know. But yeah, that was, that was a sad day in the eighth grade for me. Yeah, it was, uh, so I was the last the chair. That, that was, yes, that was my last time. Music Aww. is high pressure, I feel like, when you're that age. Because I remember auditioning for jazz band when I was in like eighth grade. And I was, yeah. I messed up like my first audition because I was so nervous about it, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think my issue was I never took it seriously enough. All of my for oh, shame. Yeah, well, yeah. So I played violin for like 15 years, and my life. private teacher retired, and then I had to become self motivated, which mm. to this day I have like such an issue with. And <laughs> you didn't hear that, Brody? Yeah, um, yeah I know. I'm sitting here. right here. Like, here. Um, <laughs> no, Same, yeah. I don't have any performance anxiety. Well, either. it just has to do with anxiety in general, and the way I deal with anxiety is just making everything into performance piece and almost like a long joke mm, and sure. my audition for first violin chair I had to play like a certain uh, Vivaldi I think it was like that spring piece like yeah. yeah and <laughs> it was called that spring piece you know that one yeah you know that one, <laughs> one. Just like, yeah, that's yeah the piece. this is the one that's in a jewelry it. commercial yeah. and uh, in the True. middle I just <laughs> broke it down to green day time of your life that's yes cool, you did though. Edley yeah. and cause You're yeah like, it was just one of those things that me as like my attention deficit child mind went to was like oh this kind of sounds okay so i'm gonna like head into this melody and kind of jam for a second <laughs> and yeah. some tables just like get out of here annie and you're just like oh i got kicked out of i got choir. kicked out of choir or <laughs> that violin chair so wow. that was the end of my violin career. i feel like that should be rewarded you know yeah. that's a problem was that in school yeah it was in high school yeah. yeah, that's a problem in public schools, you know. They I don't know, reward creativity. Sure. They don't. Yeah, it's they, the system, man. Yeah. I have a lot to say Trying about to the public down. school system, but yeah. <laughs> that whole chair system is terrible. <laughs> I, I think we should do away with that whole <laughs> thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone has every chair. It doesn't matter. Yeah, we're all... Because yeah. you, you have a daughter and do you have kids? I do. I have yeah. a six-year-old daughter. Okay, yeah. so do you? does she play instruments or anything? The Not chair yet, system might get her too. I know. Yeah. I know. Sure See, that's system. why we got to change it now. Yeah. <laughs> Protect it's, Margaret. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, she loves music, but uh, no, not yet. Yeah. So. Yeah. I always dreaded that too. Because there was like three people in our class that played the trumpet or whatever. And to be last of three, I feel like is way worse than being last of nine. Like I, no, I would true. agree. Yeah, mm-hmm. maybe or maybe not. Yeah. I don't know. I guess depending upon who the preceding. It's yeah, like it has yeah. to do with yeah, like the ratios, right? Yeah. Being like, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I feel like it should be easier to get to the top when you're there's only three people right. there. Yeah. Let me open. We'll start a petition. It's, yeah, there we go. Yeah, petition like to official. end the chair system. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you're from way in the East Coast. Mm-hmm. What brought you here? What were you doing before before you moved? You moved how long ago? To yeah. Portland? So every spring in March, I celebrate my move anniversary to <laughs> <laughs> Portland. Sure. Yeah. So I graduated college in 2012. I spent what I call like the lost year in Connecticut, trying to like figure my stuff out, my mm. life, living with my parents in Southern Connecticut and commuting to New York. I was like writing articles for a music promotion company because I was really into like the music scene at mm. the time. And a lot of what I did towards the end of my time in college was like English teaching focused, even though my college career was very all over the place because they wanted you to be all over the place, which is like super cool for somebody coming from a high school population of 2000 students to all of a Mm. sudden having a class with three students in a class that you made up. I think it definitely worked out for me. Mm. It took some time to get used to and be self-driven and self-motivated. And that was like... Bring it back to that. (laughs) Don't Don't fire me. That like hit me all of a sudden was like, oh, you have to like say what you want and where you like your learning style and what you want Mm. to do. That's hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I entered school like the ripe age of 17 college and 
I mean, I'll get into like why I homebrewed and didn't turn 21 until after I graduated and wanted to drink beer. But yeah, so me moving out here was just kind of like I had tired out all possibility of living in Boston. I'd been living in Maine. That's where I went to school. Mm -hmm. And I thought Portland wasn't necessarily like feasible for me. And New York City was just kind of like tired to me at that point and yeah. super overpopulated and, and really unfeasible you know yeah. living expense wise yeah and i mean i had been working like three jobs living with my parents and i knew the income that i was making not paying rent and it's like there's no way that i could pay rent on top of that sure yeah, yeah so that was kind of that i had never been to portland i had never visited portland How'd you pick it? You just were like, let's go there? Yeah, kind of. So it was like my childhood best friend had just done this like huge road trip and he had come back and was like, so I know you're not trying to live with your parents. I'm not trying to live with my parents. Portland, Oregon. Let's do it. Great. I got a car. I have a friend who lives there that we can sublet for. Let's do it. Wow. So... So, it's huge. It'll be yeah. 10 years this spring. Does your friend still live here? Yeah. Okay. I was going to yeah, say, that'd be yeah, weird yeah. if they, if, if yeah, you are. Uh, <laughs> of course, as one does when you move here with somebody, uh, you end up seriously dating them and then deciding oh, that sure. that's not a good idea. <laughs> so we're still super <laughs> dear friends. And yeah. I mean, says everyone I know, does. You yeah. know, the common practice. <laughs> the common practice of moving to a foreign place with somebody. And then dating. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I've known him since I was like 12 years old. And yeah, the fact that we took a month out of our lives to drive out here and visit all of our friends from Colorado to New Mexico, Southern wow, California. Yeah. Places that like I to this day want to go back to because it was super special. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Did he ever tell you why he wanted to come out here or was it just like a, a grand mystery? It was a grand mystery. He had two of our really good friends were going to school down in Salem at Willamette mm. University. So that was really the only people that we knew out here. Wow. And yeah, the major thing was that I didn't know anyone and yeah. I kind of just wanted to start all over and see what would happen and challenge myself. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And knowing that I could make such a big move into like such a small community that is Bar Harbor where I went to college. It's Mm -hmm. like a small fishing lobster community to essentially New York City that I could make a life for myself up there. I can do it across the country. Yeah. So. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. Yeah. I could never live in New York City. Like I, I lived in Chicago and it gave me anxiety just yeah. living there. So I mean, it's cool. uh, Chicago's another beast though. And it's itself like just so many different like neighborhoods that are all of themselves. All the and you have to I have mean, a car New York. too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's just like yeah, a imagine. like yeah. a common saying of like New Yorkers aren't nice, but they're kind. People mm. from the West Coast are nice, but they're not kind. Mm. And that's like the mentality that I miss. It's like this weird passive aggressiveness out here yeah, that I yeah. don't encounter. The is totally that way. They call yeah. it like, like there's a lot of like the Seattle no. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. The world that I grew up it's in. It's like, so tell, I'm, like me, tell me, which, tell me yeah. how you really feel. Did you participate in that in the Seattle oh, no? I mean, it's like, it's one of those things once it was pointed out to me and it took. So I was a river guide for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And so I would like interact with people from kind of all over. And it took me some time to kind of see those habits within myself. Mm. It was funny because like my very best friend who I ended up moving to China with and stuff did not date him, but <laughs> also because he's... Yeah. Uh, not yet. It was more of like David doing shit and then me trying to be like, please don't die. Uh, yeah. but, so me and David, like it took uh because he would be like talking to someone and be like, man, and he was like, yeah, I asked him if they wanted to come study with me and they said maybe. And then like they won't text me back and I'm like, yeah, that, that means no. And he was just like, what? And I was like, yeah. Like if someone from the Pacific Northwest, if you ask them to do a plan and they say, yeah, maybe I'll do that. That just means that's a nice way of saying no. But it took me like a good amount of time to adapt to that and stuff. And even I was homeschooled. Like my siblings all adapted a lot faster. I was homeschooled for most of my teen years so sure yeah a little bit (laughs) and then it was like then i felt like i was like come get under my wing you know yeah all you ducklings yeah elsewhere i will show you the way of passive aggressive (laughs) yeah people assume that like hustle and bustle of like a busy city is just like you feeling better than the people that you're crunching over walking over but it's really just like 
purpose. Mm-hmm. Like you have to find that purpose. You have to, I mean, yeah, you're spending most of your time commuting, but it's for that purpose. I mean, it's kind of like why I moved away from it. I was spending my last, the last year I was doing teaching in inner city, New York and Harlem at a science-based school. And yeah, a lot of what I was doing was Montessori method, outdoor learning Mm. targeted, because that's what I specialized in college. And that just doesn't work in a school where your funding is coming from the public. And all you're doing is essentially fighting the system. And I did. And I got in trouble a ton of times because, yeah, I took the kids when I wasn't allowed to take them out. And I like started a compost program at that school. (laughs) And but yeah, it's one of those things where it's I wish it was a different scenario for those kids in Harlem and they weren't operating like in a public scenario. But yeah, that was one of the catalysts of like why I left teaching because I, I, there were bigger fish to fry that I, I wasn't a large enough fish to fight those fish. Yeah. You need yeah. a lot of those fish. You know? I need, you need, I need like- a shark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. It's funny like talking about all that stuff because I'm from the Midwest, so we don't say no. Like there's no, there's not even passive aggressiveness. It's just like, yeah. I'll just do whatever, just, you know? Yeah. I'll just like be selflessness. There. I'll say yes because even if I don't want to do it. And then you follow up and you're 10 minutes early. <laughs> you also brought donuts and coffee. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Make sure to say hi to everyone. <laughs> People people will find it weird when you wave at them here, I found. Yeah. You know, I wave yeah. at people. Say hi. Yeah. yeah. That is like a, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like, don't talk to me. Yeah, <laughs> I know, yeah. Do I know you? That's yeah. More well, Minneapolis a- is very much, you know, yeah. when we moved there from Dallas, it was, I mean, really polar opposite. I mean, in terms mm. of, I, I'll never forget when we moved. My Especially wife from and I, Dallas. That's yeah, weird. My yeah. wife and I moved from California to Dallas. And I remember the first weekend I was at a Safeway or something buying groceries or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the, this lady in front of me in line, she's like, hey, what are you buying there? You know, I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, she wants mind your business. none of your that's business, I'm right? I'm like, that, that's my guacamole. <laughs> like, don't look at my guacamole. Yeah, you know? yeah. And uh, and so, and then she's like, well, you having a party? You know, I was like, like again, like I'm like no, I just moved here, you know what? So what she, the third right, degree? I'm like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's not that I'm, I'm an sorry, unfriendly officer. person. It's just I'm, you know, Californians are very used to just like sure. we, we kind of stay in our own bubble, and you know, sure. it's just yeah, yeah. like you know, it's I just don't really yeah. want to talk to you. And so, so she talked to me, and then she finished her transaction. I'm like, oh, thank goodness, like she's gonna go move on. No, she mm-hmm. waited while I bagged my own groceries and stuff, and then she followed me out to my car. And I thought, well, I'm really not that good looking, like, and I'm, gonna, I'm, like, and I'm not that charming. Yeah. So like maybe you know, but that was just that was like a great entry into how life is in Dallas it, that people are very friendly they want to interact with you and it was so shocking to me yeah. that uh, but over the six years Brody's that we like, lived is there this be forever yeah I was like I know and it really was but it actually was wonderful because what I learned in that like if there was any like lesson or whatever was that there was an authenticity Mm-hmm. There, you know, mm-hmm. there was also showboating in, you know, Dallas. It's it's kind of like sure. you know, how big oh, is your sure. hair and what but kind of car do you drive? The largest amount of immigrants in America, like Dallas, yeah. is the largest amount of immigrants in any other city, which is insane. Oh, it's insane to think it. about I when you think it. of other like yeah, port cities and yeah. Things. yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, it was just it was just a very much you know it was like you opened your garage door and if you're out hanging out like all these neighbors would come over and they would have beers with you. And at first you're yeah. like, well, I was just hoping to be by myself. But then you just kind of get used to it. And then like, you know, I mean, and then when people don't show up, it's like, oh man, like did I, you know, and it's just like, oh, well maybe they were busy that, is, that day. That right? is a cultural, yeah. yeah it's it's interesting. Yeah, it's super different. Yeah. Yeah. So then like, I guess I'm really curious, Dallas to Minnesota, what was that like? Because Minnesota is friendly in a whole different way than yeah. Texas. Yeah, well, it's so funny when you guys were talking about the passive aggressiveness. I've never lived, and especially in the corporate world, like, the level of passive aggressive tendencies in nature like was really For my hard. last email. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's just like, oh man, it's just nauseating. What you do know? they and actually so, mean? Yeah, so that, sure. that that took a long time, you know. Yeah. And, uh, to realize people that are being like genuinely kind to you, not just being like sure. uh, right. sharky. Well, the thing about Minneapolis I learned too, and it might be different in greater Minnesota. I don't know. I don't mm-hmm. want to paint a, such a broad brush, but my experience there was that everyone that grew up there, they might have went away, mm. but then they moved back yeah. and they move right back in with their childhood friends and stuff. Sure. And they're like, nope, I'm kind of full up on friends. Like, yeah. And so you have this weird dynamic of you have all these 
Minnesotans that that have kind of grown up together and are, are kind of cliquish in a way. Right. And then you have all the people that have moved there that are recent transplants. Yeah, and, interesting. And yeah. they kind of hang out and they rarely kind of, they might interact at work, but never on the weekends. And, sure. you know, I think that there's, what's that saying that Minnesotans will give you directions anywhere, just never to their own house, <laughs> you know? And so, sure. so I think, you know. <laughs> Again, like, you know, again, not, not everyone and I'm just, you know, whatever, but my brother uh, lived in Minneapolis for a while and I, he had a similar like sentiment where it's like, yeah, yeah, it's like, they're really, really kind, but it's more about like, they're nice, but not kind. Goodwill towards people, not necessarily like, let's be best friends. Yeah. 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 No, it's very much. Yeah. See on Monday, not like, Hey, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, you're going to that fun concert. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. You forget yeah. how big it is, though. It's a huge city. It's yeah. Massive. Twin City's is yeah. giant. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. Yeah. We really enjoyed, I mean, aside from the winters were just insane. Actually, mm-hmm. the summers weren't, I mean, it's super humid, like, yeah. you know, but at least um, Very aggressive the weather. quality of life is really great there. I mean, the parks, the schools, yeah. the infrastructure. I mean, there's, there's a lot of great things about the Twin Cities that, yeah. that we just loved. I mean, we loved it there once we got the hang of the social idiosyncrasy, you know, know, like just the, you know, know kind of how to fit in type things. Yeah. So growing up, like, what were you interested in doing outside of school? Like, what were you doing for fun outside? I have always been like a really thirst for knowledge reader. So I just Mm -hmm. read a lot of different things. And I was really interested, two things. I've, I've always been really interested in language. I write poetry. When I was in high school, I used to actually like do slam poetry and like rap cool. battle and stuff. Like, rap so battle. like when I was a teen, I would like, <laughs> I, would sneak, love to hear I, would, like yeah. I would sneak out of my house when I was a teenager, like 14, 15. And I would like take the bus and like, and I, I grew up in Gig Harbor. So I would have to like a walk a long way and a friend would pick me up and we would go yeah. and stuff. And I would rap battle in Tacoma. My name was Ginger Snap. Wow. And it was 2002. So I was like, I, well, I mean, I started when I was like 13, 14. I was like, I started because wow. I had gone to a private school when I was in eighth grade. And so I like made friends with a, with a kid who had a brother who could drive and we, who would take us to these like spoken word poetry slams. And then I met people from that. But anyway, so I, yeah, I was, I would call myself Ginger Snap and I'll try wow. if you nasty because it was <laughs> that time. That's what hip Wow, that's awesome. So yeah. I would, yes, yeah, so that was you like make my a thing. Called that, by I, the way. We it should. was bad. Oh, it was really yeah. bad. I was, oh, I was not, not. <laughs> no, I mean, like, I, and then that, like, I was not good. I was not good. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys remember, you talked about this a little bit. Like, what was the first beer that you ever made and was it good? Do you remember? What was the first one you ever made? Yeah, it was... Because you were under underage, I'm assuming? Yeah, yeah. So, I didn't turn 21 until, I mean, my senior year of college. And What a rough college, That's bro. Rough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. where I went to school, it was super small. And there is, if you're from the East Coast, you know what a bodega is? I don't know so, what a bodega is. Uh, it uh, is a... Pressure? It's a mart where you can buy blunt wraps and beer okay. and a sandwich. And a banana. Okay. And there's a cat <laughs> that's like super cute that you want to sure. steal. So yeah, there was one bodega on the island where I went to school. And if you weren't 21, the person who tended said bodega knew you weren't 21. Mm. And I wasn't friends with like a ton of upperclassmen. So I had to essentially wait until I was 21 my senior year to be drinking beer except for the fact that I homebrewed starting my freshman year. Mm. And it wasn't good. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, but I forced it down. So what I was drinking... I forced I'll, it down. <laughs> but I forced it down. And a lot of what I was drinking was Allagash and Shipyard. What kind of beer is that? So Allagash White is a quintessential Belgian white beer. Okay. Um, so very light-bodied, peppery, quintessential ester profile of Belgian yeast, which my... Belgian white recipe. Oh, oh man, I hope no one ever sees that ever. <laughs> Hide it, burn it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. but Shipyard was easier because they mimicked a lot of their beers off English style beer, which is malt mm. forward beer and a lot more forgiving. So it is the closet beer that you can forget about and check mm. up on a few months later and be like, oh, like this is actually tasting pretty so good. Something I need to make. Yeah, it's like pretty <laughs> decent. So yeah, I would do like cloned what's called their double bag, which is an alt beer. Mm-hmm. And it was like 9%. So I was super excited wow. <laughs> about a 9% homebrew. Yeah. Wow. Um, but I mean, with the palate that I have now, testing that beer at that point, it was probably garbage. But at yeah. that point, I was like, this tastes like something that's not water and Heineken and PBR. Yeah. It's awesome 
Yeah. Multi beer. Yeah. Multi, multi hop water, essentially. So, but yeah, I mean, it definitely took a lot, a lot more trial and errors. Actually, I to this day homebrew, and I think the beers that I produce at work taste a lot better than my homebrew. Well, you also find that, like, I remember, I mean, my first batch of homebrew, yeah, like I said earlier, was horrendous. That was trash, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And then I think as you, (laughs) what I learned is there's kind of two ways to make good homebrew. The first is, you go out and you buy the most expensive equipment and you find all of these things sure. and glycol jacketed five gallon, you know, like yeah. coolers. And, and before you know it, as my wife can attest, you know, you have a garage full of this stuff and like amazing. <laughs> and, and you, you might as well and, be and the hobby, yeah. yeah. And then the hobby kind of turns more into a way to acquire more stuff, you know, sure. uh, you know, as opposed <laughs> yeah. to making yeah, more yeah, homebrew. Yeah. Or the other alternate path is is you can use the equipment that you have and you can lean on the folks that do a really good job and you can learn. Mm. And I think mm. that, I, I mean, one of my, you know, the the guy that trained me as a BJCP judge and he and I are good friends to this day, but back in the day, like he kind of brewed in like an old shoe box. I mean, it was basically yeah. this kind of like cobbled together equipment and he would make the most wonderful beers. I mean, mm. and so I think that was a good kind of like early lesson for me that it was like, wow, maybe I don't need to invest in all this high end equipment. I just kind of need to pay attention to what the heck I'm doing, yeah. you know? Sure. Um, sure, yeah, yeah. So, but you learn how to, you know, I mean, when you're home brewing, you're you're also you're experimenting five gallons at a time. So it's like, wow, yeah, I can throw that in the beer, or I can try this, or I can make an ice box, or I can, you know, yeah, if it turns out like garbage, then you dump it down the drain, sure. uh, and all is not lost. But it's kind of fun to push the envelope in that way. Yeah, yeah. So, what is like a beer that you guys have created that you felt like really? push your career forward was there one that you made that was like this is it everybody needs to have this you know and it would like made a difference getting a job yeah for sure i make this beer i call gin and juice okay and i've actually i've made it at every place that i've been the head brewer and it all started from this like little competition that we had at rock bottom during Zuckel mania and basically like so me and the other two brewers we would all make a single keg version of a beer so mm. my friend and we would basically like have a tasting competition and whichever one won we make a whole batch serve it on tap and so mine was a a belgian table beer and then i infused it with like gin botanicals mm. and grapefruit and it was great and it won and we made it and it was you know whatever and then i've made it at other places since and it's always been quite popular because it just tastes boozy and fresh and yeah Belgian-y and stuff. So that's definitely like one where it's like, I had been working for like a long time leading up to that time. And then finally, it was like the first time I got credit for sure my own creative process and the process that I had used to make that beer were all very like homebrew centric, but not anything that we had been doing at Rock Bottom and stuff. And so it was like, it worked out well and it was delicious yeah. and it was exciting. Yeah, it's yeah. really exciting yeah. when you have that first beer everyone tastes and yeah. you know, I love Jip botanicals. It's hard too. It gets really bitter, yeah, really fast. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, for me, it was it was a beer I did for my mom. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. Did you name it after her? Yeah, I did name it after her. There um, you go. So it's a beer called Edith. So again, my mom's from Poland. So she was feeding me beer super early on. So I attribute <laughs> a lot of my. Uh, <laughs> love for uh, gathering around a pint to her. But yeah, yeah so I made a Grodzicki or Grotzer style Polish smoked ale in her honor when I was at Breakside. It's for a festival that's done every year called She Brew. Mm. So yeah, yeah. so a couple, I mean, more than a couple, but a handful of ladies in the industry get together and no matter where they are, whether it be front of house, seller side, brew side, owner side, marketing side, they all get together with the brewery that they're at and trying to come up with a recipe for the festival. And I had done another beer before that, but I think the beer that I owe a lot of my creativity to was this Grodzicki style beer where it was very traditional. It is a very polarizing beer. It's a smoked beer. Oh, so does it taste if you've like ever smoky? had one? Yeah, yeah. so it I've tastes one, it tastes like bacon. <laughs> I would probably <laughs> like, like it. It's wonderful. Camp- yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was like, say, you you camp- had me a bacon. Yeah, 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 like liquid campfire and bacon, but like also is like light and yellow. Mm. So super easy drinking. Traditionally, it's like in the three to four percent range. I think traditionally it's called the champagne of beers because it mm. has like a super foamy head. 
And that just has to do with like the process that it goes through. But, and then again, what other opportunity do you have to name beer after your mother? That, yeah. You know, or anything after your mother. Or anything that. after yeah, your mom. Cool. Yeah. 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 That was for me like a big. And people, I, I had a bunch of like peers and of course my family just reaching out to me being like, this is really, really freaking good. Yeah. And yeah, I hope to keep brewing that beer. Yeah. What is, again, the, the date you're going to be open here and like where can people find more information about what you guys are doing? Yeah. So we're opening on July 31st and uh, you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Steeplejack Beer and then uh, SteeplejackBrewingCompany.com. Awesome. It's our website. And uh, yeah, we're just really excited. On our, on our first day, we're going to have a big grand opening celebration, with a time capsule and giveaways. Oh, and, time and fun. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to be the... Where are you Actually, put it? Brody, you should speak on that a little bit. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. so I'll, I'll tell the kind of the truncated story. But yeah, when, when Taft was here in 19... Uh, President Taft in 1909 dedicated the building... And he put a time capsule in the corner, the actual cornerstone of the building. Of this building? Of this like building. Keystone, he put, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, they put a uh, put a flag and, and some other mementos. And because uh, Taft was a mason, he actually used his like mason trowel and actually put it in the corner. Wow. Um, so at some point in the building's history, uh, I think in the 60s, that the capsule was unearthed and, and taken and the contents were lost. But mm. when we purchased the church and we met with the congregation, they actually gave me the original brass box that was there. Oh, cool. That's empty. But we thought... What a great opportunity to invite the community to either put a memento or put their name or, or something like that and then seal it up. And then there's a plate that's, you know, like a, cool. a concrete thing. So, so yeah, you know, the whole thing about it's like, you know, what a great time because we're coming out of the, the fog of yeah. COVID. And, and while we're not completely out, we're close. I think it's it's about how can we reconnect with others? How can we engage in authentic community? And that's what we're all about. It's it's very much we're a come as you are kind of place yeah. and uh, and come gather and drink amazing beer brewed by amazing folks so. yeah no that's really cool i mean thank you guys so much for having me thank here. you it's beautiful yeah. seriously thank you for coming out here yeah, yeah. And, like chatting with us and stuff it's been you know it's like i learned new things about uh, yeah yeah, yeah. we could have chatted stuff. for hours more i feel like but <laughs> the sun is going to go down I, like, I mean that's what's so fun about this podcast is it's like i feel like that's the nature of like meeting new people is like everyone is so like deeply faceted you know so you yeah. find all these little treasure nuggets of stories and anecdotes and yeah everyone stuff, everyone fun. has a life you know so mm-hmm. there's always stuff to talk about yeah. you know and it sounds so like silly and simple to say it that way but it's like really true like we kind of yeah. forget especially when you're focused on your own projects your own dreams your own life that everyone's doing that same shit you know so and you're like, interesting yeah you know? that's, what I, that's what I always like to tell people you are interesting yeah you know? and people are nice Maybe. and kind yes <laughs> yes and on a positive note but yeah that's i right. feel like that's that's the, that's the case you know some people are i'm like asking them to be on and they're like no i don't really i don't really have anything to talk about i'm not really that interesting i'm like you are though yeah. i bet yeah. trust me you do i bet and we like could talk for hours yeah. you know for so sure. yeah so thank you guys so much thank for you, you. Thanks very much. Much.